So if you will, turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 14. But I do want to finish. I, I believe this is such a word that the Lord has given us about the church and the condition of the church and the age at which we live in, that this church, being the church of Laodicea, is the present-day church. And many times our church has been known, our churches have been known as the lukewarm church. And that was mostly what you will find about this church that you find in Laodicea. So if you'll begin reading with me in verse 14, Revelation chapter 3. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness of the beginning, the creation of God. I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich, have become wealthy, have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke, and chasten before, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word of God today. And oh, that God, you'd speak to us this morning. I pray, Lord, that our mind will be alert, our heart will be renewed, our body a temple of the Spirit of God that we would say today, speak, Lord Jesus. May we hear the word of the living God today. And today, Father, may it impact and change our lives, that our lives may glorify you. And to God be the glory, the great things that you'd want to do in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The address to this church is very much relevant to the fact it's present day. And I do believe that Christ, when he was speaking to this church, warns us here and lets us see that he does not commend this church. He speaks to a church that's very wealthy. He speaks to Laodicea, which is the chief city in uh, Perga, and it's very, very extremely wealthy and prosperous as a city known for its medical schools and ISAVs and known for its being a center of finance. It was very popular in the Roman Empire for emperors who were wanting to come to be entertained and be a part of continual pleasure in that city. You'll find addressed in this church what is unique is that it's addressed one time in the book of the Colossians. You'll see that Paul addresses that church in Laodicea by telling the church at Colossae that they need to read this letter to the church at Laodicea. And so they were commanded by the Apostle Paul to hear the Word of God, to hear the letter. And I do believe it had something to do with their spiritual state. The Bible says in Colossians 4.16 they were commanded to read the Word of God in Laodicea. You're going to find that from the time we left off in Philadelphia in 1905 to the present day, never before has the Word of God, never before has there been so much criticism to Christianity and the Word of God. The Bible's been criticized by liberal theologians. It's been criticized by scientists, philosophers, and historians. And this is an age known mostly for being spiritually corrupt because we have gotten away from the Word of God. There was a time when I was a small child in the church, nobody argued was the Word of God inspired. Nobody argued was the Word of God given to us by God. Nobody had debates over that, but there was a continual downtrodden, backslidden state that has led us to an age of spiritual corruption. And most of that comes from being a church that's moving away from the Word of God. And so this morning when we look, we see that Jesus addresses this church. Now, the first thing I want you to notice in your notes this morning is how he addresses this church. Jesus addresses the church for being lukewarm. And you'll notice this for this reason. 
Jesus is talking about the atmosphere and the condition of the church. He's addressing it as he did many times in his teaching almost by drawing a parallel or, mo or a parable to the fact of saying, here is the condition, of, uh, this is a sign I want to give to you about the area you live in. Now you notice this, he's addressed them about their spiritual wealth, he's addressed them about their medical, he's addressed them about their clothing that was mostly known in that city. But notice what the Lord Jesus says to it. The Lord Jesus says to the city, <coughs> you're lukewarm. You're neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm. And what he does is, is he says, here's what you are. He takes the idea of sharing with us that Heropolis was a place where the warm springs were that came down into that city. Colossia, the nearby city, where the cold water came in. And when it came into that city, it became lukewarm. Very much, it was not something you wanted to put in your mouth. And so the Lord Jesus was saying to the church here, he says, here's the condition of Laodicea. It's like that well out there. When you put it in your mouth, you want to spew it out. So the Lord Jesus was saying to the church at Laodicea, I'm drawing a parallel to you of saying you are like lukewarm water in my mouth I want to spew you out and notice what he says to the church he says I'd rather you be hot or cold now I don't know about you but this I do know I enjoy a beverage that's hot or cold but not stale this is what he was saying to the church he's saying I enjoy a beverage that's hot or cold but not a stale church, not a lukewarm church. You see, I, I enjoy, especially in the winter season, hot coffee. I like real hot coffee. I enjoy in the summertime, and especially in South Georgia, a cold beverage, a cold drink of water, a cold Diet Coke, but not stale, not lukewarm, not that has no taste in our mouth. And I want to remind you of a word maybe that we need to see here. The Bible tells us in the book of Psalm, chapter 34, verse 8, this. It says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And you know what Jesus was saying to the church there in Laodicea? The taste is not good in the mouth when you come into the church. It's not hot or cold. It's stale. It's lukewarm. And this is the word I believe the Lord I, I begin to speak into my heart about this hot and cold. And if I, I had to look this morning, I tell you, I wouldn't have to go back but to one church, to the church of Philadelphia. And there you could see a church hot and on fire for God when it come to winning souls. And they had great zeal and zest for living for God because they were winning people to Jesus. And I believe Jesus was saying to the church of Laodicea, I wish you were hot. I wish you were hot for souls. I wish you had zeal for God. I wish you had a desire to reach people for Christ. I believe he's saying to the church, I wish you were hot. This is why I wish you were hot. I wish that people knew you by the fire of God that was in you to win people to Jesus. And then he also says, or I'd rather you be cold. And you know, there's no place throughout the Word of God where Jesus said, I'm hoping you got a cold heart. Matter of fact, we look at people with a cold heart and say they're the hardest to reach. But you know what I believe God was saying to the church right here? I've read a hundred commentaries on people who said, well, if they were cold, they could get made hot. Let me tell you what I really believe he's saying to the church. He's saying, if you're not going to be hot, maybe you could be cold. I wish you were cold. Maybe if somebody were coming into your church, maybe that you could give them a cold drink of water because they could taste and see that the Lord was good and you could refresh them. So the church ought to be either hot for winning people to Jesus or refreshing when you come in that, man, you've had a cool drink of water this morning because you went to church today and you were refreshed in the Lord. And when you came in, you got a good sip from a cold well that refreshed you and renewed you and made you more like Jesus and awoke you to the things of God. And this is why I believe Jesus said, I wish you were hot or cold, but not stale. I wish when people walked in the door of our church said, no, we're either hot for winning souls. Man, we want to see people saved. We're burning to see people come to Christ. Or man, we are a refreshing drink of water that when you walked in, you felt like you'd been in the presence of the Lord today and you've celebrated the goodness of the Lord and you've come out of a dry, barren desert and today you've got a good drink of water from the cup of heaven and the fountain of heaven just ran over you today. You felt like you were drinking out of a hydrant of heaven. Amen. 
You know, church, that's the way church ought to be. Amen? Not stale. Not lukewarm. Not a place that when you walked in on Sunday morning you couldn't wait to get out, but a place where you couldn't get enough. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, that he refreshed me today, that he reminded me today, that he renewed me today. Oh, taste and see that when I came to church today, I got a mouthful of a refreshing drink of God, of a hot cup of coffee today that stirred my soul for winning people to Jesus. God helped the church to remember what we've been called to do. Because when God looks at this church, let me tell you what he was saying to it. I hope you'll look at this in the Word of God. He said, here's what you are, you're lukewarm. But here's why you're lukewarm. You see, you're lukewarm because you're using the wrong measurement. You're lukewarm because when you look out there, you brag on your wealth. And you've got impressive stats, but you have no spiritual value about you. You cannot see reality because you haven't anointed your eyes with a vision of heaven. You only see what's around you without seeing what God wants you to see. You see, church, it's easy for me to come in here and look within the four walls and turn us inward and look at one another. But God wants us to see the vision of heaven that looks upon others. Amen, church. And so when he looks into our life here, he says, this is what the church really is. He said, you're blind to what I want to show you. You're using the wrong measurement. You brag about how much you have, but do you have Christ? He's on the outside of the church looking in. And literally, this is what he says the church is. Really, you're naked. And the word there in the Greek for naked means humiliated, defeated. Can you ask me, can you tell me this? Why are so many Christians spiritually defeated? The Bible talks to us about being victorious, overcomers, champions of God, children of the Most High God, heirs with the Christ in the throne room of grace. He talks about us as one who sets with Him as He has overcome, we would too. He talks about a victorious life in Christ. And yet He says we're naked and defeated right here. And I want to say to the body of Christ, anyone who's saved sitting here this morning, you ought to be living the abundant, spirit-filled, joyful life in the Lord that is victorious and not being defeated. You have the Holy Ghost of God living in you. Really, what's the problem? The Word of God teaches us here that Jesus was saying, this is the church I need you to be. It should be a church that is thriving, but it's a church that's embarrassed because it's naked before the Lord. It's been revealed what God says about this church. And so when he looks into this church, he says, literally, you're really naked when you ought to be thriving. You're embarrassed when you ought to be the church that is living in a day that's making a difference. Let me tell you what Jesus is saying. They could have went in and talked about the condition of the church and how bad it was in their area and how bad things were going, and we could too. As the church of the living God, we could look out here and find all the problems, but what we need to understand is we have the answers. The problems are going to exist, but we've got the answer to the problem through Jesus Christ. And what God is saying to the church is, this ain't the time for the church to be embarrassed. It ought to be the time when the church is clothing itself in the humility and the righteousness and the holiness of God and the church is being the church it's been called to be. And I look at this passage of Scripture and I think about God addressing this church. He said, you're lukewarm. And then he goes on to say this. Notice what he warns them of. Now listen, he addresses the church about their lukewarm condition. But this is what we don't see in some of the other churches. He warns them about that lukewarm condition. He don't only tell them they're lukewarm, but he warns them of what will happen if they stay lukewarm. He says this. Listen to what the Lord Jesus says. I will spew you out of my mouth. Ain't it wonderful to come to church during Christmas and talk about vomiting and being spewed out of the mouth? I mean, honestly. But notice what the Lord Jesus says here. He says, not only do I notice your condition, but this will be the result of this condition. I will spew you out of my mouth. I don't want to be the church Jesus spews out of his mouth. Amen? Listen to what Jesus is saying here. And this is what I want you to think in this term. Here the great physician is, the creator of the universe, giving the church an examination. Now, a couple weeks ago, I got real sick. I've never in my life had the flu and strep throat at the same time. 
I, I've missed two Sundays preaching in 27 years being sick. So it don't happen a lot. And I hate being sick. Matter of fact, I was so sick on Friday, I said, Lord, either rapture the church or just kill me. I don't care. Either way. Either way, I'm good. Either way, I'm good. But man, let me tell you what I did. I, very few times I would do, I, I, I go to the doctor. And the doctor begins to look at my condition. Now, folks, it's foolish to go to a doctor and ask them what's wrong and then not be willing to do what they say. I go to the doctor, and he takes this thing and sticks it up my nose and progs my brain. <laughs> Anybody been there? I mean, there ain't a lot up there. You can't prod too long. But he progs around, comes back in about 15 minutes and says, you've got the flu. Test show, you've got the flu. So the condition is you've got the flu. He starts prodding around, feeling things, breathing. He said, let me look in your mouth. And he's looking around. He said, did they do a culture on your throat? No. So he says, we're going to do that. So he takes this swab and sticks it down my throat. I knew what throwing up was about to be, I'm telling you. <laughs> he comes back in 15 minutes. He says, you ought to get a lottery ticket. You're hot today. You're getting it all. <laughs> he says, you've got the flu. You've got strep throat. He said, these are, the, th these are your conditions, but here's what you need to do. And he gives me the medicine I'm going to need to take, the rest I'm going to need for the next few days. And, and, you know, church, I found myself, I needed to do what the doctor said. To get better, I needed to do this. Here's where the church struggles sometimes. The great physician stands in front of us and tells us our condition and says, this is what you need to do to get better, and we ignore it. Jesus is the great physician, and he tells you, this is what it's going to take. Here is your true condition, and this is what you need to do. And the very danger that we could have as a church is to reject what he says. To continue on in the same place only makes the church sicker. It only puts a condition in us that becomes spiritually bankrupt and not spiritual to God at all. And matter of fact is, he says the condition in you could get worse to the point of nauseated. Jesus said, I will spew you out of my mouth. And what Jesus is saying here is a lukewarm condition means you're trying to serve God and mammon, which cannot be done. It makes Christ nauseated for the church to try to serve too. And the word of God teaches us that they were unconcerned about godliness. So they were unconcerned <coughs> about their condition. And church, God helped the church that we wouldn't be concerned about the great physician standing at our door, giving us an examination and saying, this is the condition, this is what's going to happen if you don't do something about it. It's time to get to the great physician and get healed. And the church here is awakened to this moment. And this is what Jesus said. Jesus said, I want to give you counsel to this. And so not only does he write out the prescription, do the x-ray, and tell them what's wrong, and tell them what will be the result of that, but the Lord Jesus comes to the church and gives them counsel of what they need to do. And this is what he says to them. He says, you need to buy gold from me. Now, they were used to purchasing things. But the things that I'm fixing to give you here are spiritual things. Notice what he tells them. Jesus gives them counsel to the church in these ways. He says, first of all, I want you to buy spiritual gold, clothing, and eye salve. And this is not what you could purchase with finances and money in your bank account. These were the things that were going to have to be purchased in God. And you know what he was saying? This is what he's saying to the church. Are you listening? Say amen. He says, I want you to check the bank account you have spiritually. <laughs> you know, church, listen. It's easy for us to look in our account and think whether we're wealthy or not by how much we got in the bank, how much we make, how much we're putting into retirement, what our 401ks look like. We're constantly looking to see if we're successful by how much money we have. What does our clothing look like? Are we physically okay? But you know what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying right here? He said, let's check the accounts when it comes to spirituality. Let me ask you this morning, how is your spiritual bank account when it comes to joy? How's your spiritual bank account when it comes to love? 
How's your spiritual bank account this morning when it comes to the fact of faith? How's your spiritual bank account this morning, church, when it comes to the assurance of your salvation? Are you sure you're saved? How is your spiritual bank account when it comes to confidence and hope and knowing you're a champion for God? Man, I pray that the church's bank account would be running over with the joy of the Lord. Amen. With the love of God and the purity of God and that the church would be so interested in the gold tried by fire, it would anoint its eyes with the eye salve of heaven so we could see the vision of God. That when we look out, we would not see what we think would make a great church, but what Jesus wants to show us makes a great church. And so he counsels us here. And this is what he says. He says, put on that eye salve and put on the white clothing of God. In other words, don't clothe yourself in something that you're trying to impress God with, but clothe yourself in humility and righteousness and holiness and the purity of God that God's impressed with what you wore to church with, with the spiritual clothes you put on this morning. Amen. You see, we impressed God this morning when we got dressed in the humility of Christ, in the garments of praise, in the righteousness of the Lord. Let me tell you something, that's a church that God's looking for that's dressed with the clothing of heaven. And the very things that were addressed in that city that they said they were best at was the very thing he counseled them to try under heaven. Try the gold of heaven. Try the bank account of heaven. Try the clothing of heaven. Try the eye salve of heaven. Tell me, are you seeing spiritually the things of God? And so God addresses them to this point. This is what he says about that condition. He says, I counsel you. <coughs> Be zealous. Repent. Those that I love, I rebuke. Think about this this morning, church. Listen to what Jesus wrote in verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Be zealous and repent and get right with God. To repent means to change your way. And what God was saying to the church is not a bad thing here. The church wants to hear Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. But whom he loves, he chastised to be the church he's called it to be. This is a, this is a father in heaven who loves us and refuses to leave us in the condition he found us in. Amen. This is a father who cares about where we're going, about our condition, if we're healthy or not, and he cares about where we're going to the fact that he would examine us and say, this is what you need. Repent and turn another way and go a different direction. That's a God who loves us because he knows the direction we're headed in is going to be spiritual death. Jesus said, I've come to give you life. I've come to give you the abundance of life. And so he counseled them to open their heart and hear where God was knocking on their door. Now listen to this. When you come to this passage of Scripture for years and years in the church, the church evangelists have used this knocking as Jesus knocking on, say, on lost people's heart to come into their heart and live forever. I don't have a problem with that. The only problem is this. Jesus is addressing the church. That means save people. He's already knocked on that heart. And let me tell you what I believe he's trying to show us here. Many times in our Christianity, we limit God to who he really is. We start telling God, you need to do this, and you need to do this, and you need to do this. That's the church of the modern day that tells God what they, that God needs to do. Instead of the church that humbles himself and makes it a servant and says, God, we're willing to do what you ask us to do. And what Jesus was doing here was knocking on the door in this way, saying, He's saying, oh, if there's those that need to be saved, I'm more than capable of saving. I'll knock upon the door, and I pray you'll have a heart for lost people, that you'll be hot for God, that the church would open the door and want to see people saved. There was nothing like this morning at 830 watching people be baptized at the 830 service this morning. You see, people being saved, that's what a church ought to be about, Amen. And he says, I'm knocking on the door. And by the way, it's not the church's place to save. It's Jesus' place to save. And what he was saying is, I'm on the outside. I'm knocking. But the church has got to have a fire and a zeal to see people be saved also. And so he's asking that. He's knocking at the door. But he's also knocking at the door of saying to those who are sitting here this morning who've been backslidden from the Lord who've been away from God, he's been knocking on the door to call you back to a close, intimate, personal relationship with him. 
Something's been put in your life, and there's a void there now where Jesus was. And he's knocking on that door because he wants to have a close personal relationship with you. To others who are sitting here this morning, Jesus knows every one of your hurts, and he's knocking on your door because he is the great physician and he knows how to heal. He knows how to minister to you today. And what the church needs to do is understand this this morning. That the church needs to learn that this letter is a church uh, uh, of the church of Laodicea is an x-ray from heaven of our true condition and understand that God is knocking on the door. And he's asking us this morning, do we want his lordship? Do we want his leadership? Do we hunger and thirst for righteousness? Do we desire the things of God? Do we look in his word this morning in hunger? Because if we did, let me tell you what the church would say. The church would renounce all lukewarmness. The church would be the church this morning that would agree with the Lord on his x-ray that we've lacked spiritual passion for seeing people come to Jesus. That we would look this morning in our life and realize it's by grace and by the Spirit of God that a covenant is made. And that we need to be reverent in seeking the Lord and desiring the relationship that He desires for us. You know what Jesus said? I've come that you may have abundant life. I've come to give you life and give it more abundantly. I've come that you be victorious, clothed in the righteousness of heaven. And Jesus is saying to us, as he stands on the outside of the church, knocking, 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 some of you, will you open the door this morning? Would you fellowship with him? Because this is what you'll notice in the Word of God, where Jesus talks about here, there being a, a victory celebration, there being a time in our life where we commune with Christ and we find that victory as overcomers because the supper room becomes a throne room with Jesus and we fellowship with him and he said this is the church I long for the church that will address their spiritual condition and say you know we've been lukewarm but we renounce that I want to be a cold drink of water refreshing I want to be a hot cup of coffee man that's zeal is for absolutely seeing people be saved God help our church to reach the full potential of what he's called us to be. Turn to your neighbor and say, I pray we get our full potential. Now say it with some zeal. <laughs> say it with some passion. Man, I want to reach the full potential of what God has for us here. Amen. I don't want to be just a church in Valdosta. I want to be a church that's got a hunger for God. A church that wants to see people saved. A church that wants to make disciples. A church that's hungry for the Word of God and a deep desire to be more like Christ. Not caring what the world says. More concerned about what Jesus says about His church. To God be the glory of a church that reaches its full potential and its true condition with God. I want to ask you to bow your head for just a second. As we pray this morning, we close. We've been talking about the churches for the last couple of months. And these letters being x-rays from heaven of our true spiritual condition of what God sees the church as. As we gave the altar call in the 830 service this morning, several came. Several came in joy and several came and prayed in this altar just renouncing lukewarmness in their life, renouncing sin, renouncing a lack of spiritual passion and a renewal with God this morning. Maybe that's you today. God's been knocking on your heart, speaking into your life this morning. Maybe there's some places you've been lukewarm. You see, folks, that's not the problem here. The problem is you don't, if you don't do something about it. Jesus has identified the problem. The great news is he's got the solution. If we'll just hear his voice this morning, hear the knock on our door today as he speaks to us, come. He invites us into the throne room of grace. And we're given an invitation this morning. I pray you'd come. Pray this morning in your life. Look and say, God, no more lukewarmness. Passion for serving Jesus. 
Father God, we are the church naked before you today. Clothe us in the righteousness of Jesus. Put on the garments of praise of our life, Lord. God, don't stand on the outside, but in the midst of your church, speak to your church today. We open the doors today, Lord. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we come before you this morning, Lord. And we renounce all lukewarmness, any lack of spiritual passion. Father, any condition in our life, God, that calls us to repent, we do openly. Ashamed of our past, gloriously looking to our future. We thank you, Lord, for loving us. And may you get the joy of seeing your church Today, Father, know you and the power of your resurrection. Father, we'll give you all the praise and the honor and the glory this morning because we leave here today knowing you love us and you care about our condition. And to God be the glory of what you want to do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.